Welcome to the inaugural Deep Thinking About Great Books podcast. I'm Spencer Baum, and today we're talking about Moby Dick by Herman Melville. As I record this, we're about halfway through our reading of Moby Dick on the Deep Thinking About Great Books Facebook page. For me, this is my second time reading the novel, and though I enjoyed it quite a bit on my first reading, on this reading, I really feel like I'm starting to get it. I'm really starting to understand why Moby Dick is considered one of America's greatest novels. This is a recording of Led Zeppelin, live in Royal Albert Hall in 1970, playing their song, Moby Dick. The song is an instrumental that is a feature for drummer John Bonham. For many fans of John Bonham, this recording is the pinnacle of rock drumming. Why is the tune called Moby Dick? Because the band, a highly literate group who devoured books while on tour, thought the aggressive blues riff could easily be the music of an aggressive monster of the sea coming in for the fight with his nemesis. I first heard Zeppelin's Moby Dick in the 90s when I was in high school. Like many teenage Gen Xers in the 1990s, I rejected the popular music of the day and dove headfirst into what was just beginning to be called classic rock. And I loved this 1970 recording of Moby Dick. My discovery of that great live Zeppelin recording from 1970 was one of two events in my teen years that led to my first attempt at reading Moby Dick. The other was in 12th grade English class. My teacher, Miss Colvard, was having us read The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner that year. And as she was introducing the book, she told us that, in her opinion, The Sound and the Fury was the third greatest American novel of all time. The second greatest American novel, Miss Colvard thought, was The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And the greatest, in her opinion, was Moby Dick. Miss Colvar didn't make us read Moby Dick. In fact, she declared that same day that she thought Moby Dick was too big and too complex to teach in a high school class. But I was thrilled to learn that the source material for one of my favorite Zeppelin songs was, in the opinion of the most well-read person in my life, number one on the countdown of top American novels. So I got a copy from the library, and I quit reading it a couple chapters in. Moby Dick really is a baffling, brutal novel, if you're not ready for it. Today, I love Moby Dick. On my list of personal favorites, that list of, say, the three novels that you would bring to a desert island, or your personal top ten list, maybe even top five list, it's on there for me. But I had to fail at reading it when I was 18, and wait for nearly 20 years to pass before I was ready to appreciate the brilliance of this novel. My experience with Moby Dick neatly mirrors the reception at large to this novel. Melville began writing Moby Dick in February of 1850. He intended to combine stories from his own experience as a sailor aboard a whaling vessel with an adventure tale rooted in the tragedy of the whaling ship Essex, which was sunk by an angry sperm whale in 1820. Melville began the novel as a story of seafaring adventure, expecting it to take him a few months. Eighteen months later, he had written a massive epic that was highly experimental, bold, original, and unlike anything ever else set to paper. With poetic prose that rightfully earns regular comparison to Shakespeare, and an ambling artist's eye to all things oceanic, Moby Dick is an undeniable work of genius, one that leaps out at us from the 19th century as being way ahead of its time. In college, one of my professors compared Moby Dick to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, those rare works so brilliant and bold that they blast open the very idea of what we think a particular art form can do. By the time Moby Dick was finished, Melville had redefined what could be done with a novel. For that reason, Moby Dick is often called the first modern novel. Sadly for Melville, Moby Dick was so far ahead of its time that the reading public didn't catch up with it until after he was dead. Moby Dick sold only 3,200 copies while Melville was alive, and was poorly reviewed by critics who had never read anything like it and didn't know what to make of it. By the time Melville died in 1891, Moby Dick was effectively out of print. 
Now might be a good time to read to you one of my favorite quotes from Melville. This is a quote Melville wrote in an essay praising his friend Nathaniel Hawthorne. He wrote these words right before settling in to work on Moby Dick. Here's the quote. It is better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. He who has never failed somewhere, that man cannot be great. Failure is the true test of greatness. Friends, I read that quote at least once a week. That quote is one of my mantras. Let's read it again. It is better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. He who has never failed somewhere, that man cannot be great. Failure is the true test of greatness. That's when the famous part of the quote ends, but in the original essay, the next sentence is a good one too. Here it is. And if it be said that continual success is a proof that a man wisely knows his powers, it is only to be added that, in that case, he knows them to be small. Wow. Just reading those words to you puts me in the right headspace to live how I want to live and do what I want to do. It's so important to me. This is a phenomenal credo, and it's why I love and admire Melville so much. Melville is saying that if you have nothing but success over and over, you are living a small life. If you are having nothing but success, you need to do harder things. You need to be challenging yourself until you find the point where you fail, and then you need to push yourself to improve until you achieve beyond that point and are ready to take on the next, even harder, challenge. Melville lived by this credo. Here's the thing about him. Before he wrote Moby Dick, he was on his way to success. His first book was a bestseller, and his next few works were well-received. In the ten-year period before he set to work on Moby Dick, Melville was having financial and critical success with his writing. Oddly enough, it was Moby Dick, the novel that, in time, would make Melville a legend, that ended his writing success in his own day. Literary critics didn't know what to make of Moby Dick when it came out. They were unsparing and nasty in their reviews, and what they hated most about the novel was the very thing that made it great. They hated how wildly different and original it was. Moby Dick is experimental. It is bold. It is part adventure novel, part memoir, part explication on whales and whaling, part philosophical treaties. It's a novel of enormous symbolism and epic scope. It's a work that today frequently gets mentioned in the same breath as Shakespeare and the Bible in its grandeur. But reviewers called it an ill-compounded mixture of romance and matter-of-fact. The London Athenaeum in its review said, The idea of a connected and collected story has obviously visited and abandoned its writer again and again in the course of composition. The style of his tale is in places disfigured by mad English, and its catastrophe is hastily, weakly, and obscurely managed. The bad reviews nuked Moby Dick before it ever had a chance. Publishers and booksellers didn't want to push the novel. Readers never heard about it. It petered out in obscurity. But, as Melville tells us, it is better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. It is better to fail in originality than succeed in imitation. Moby Dick was just too good to disappear, like the critics wanted it to. Among those 3,000 copies sold were many readers who understood that this wasn't just a good novel. It was an all-time great. Moby Dick developed a cult-like following, particularly in New York, that continued for years after Melville died. By the 1920s, the underground fascination with Moby Dick had reached American authors like Carl Van Doren and D.H. Lawrence, both of whom became evangelists for the book. Based largely on D.H. Lawrence's recommendation, in 1926, Modern Library bought the rights to Moby Dick and arranged for a new printing of it, one with illustrations by American artist Rockwell Kent. That edition and those illustrations became, arguably, the most important American literary publication in the 20th century. With that publication and the novel's growing reputation as something exceptional, Moby Dick captured the American imagination, and scholars quickly began to recognize that it was a towering literary achievement, one of the greatest American novels ever written. One of the most interesting things about the way Moby Dick came exploding onto the scene decades after the author died is that it wasn't professors and scholars who became such advocates for the book. It was artists. It was writers. It was performers. It was young Americans on the cutting edge of art. 
The two most important advocates for Moby Dick were the already mentioned D.H. Lawrence and Orson Welles. Are you ready for a treat? Friends, I've got a treat for you. Here is the highlight of episode one of the Deep Thinking About Great Books podcast. Here is Orson Welles reading the opening of Moby Dick. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long, I thought that I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Whenever I grow grim about the mouth and hazy in the eyes, whenever it's a damp November in my soul, I count it time to get to sea. Almost all men, sometime or other, cherish these same feelings toward the ocean. Why did the old Persians hold the ocean holy? And the still deeper meaning of that story of Narcissus, who, because he could not grasp the mild, tormenting image in the fountain, plunged into it and drowned. That same image ourselves see in all rivers, in oceans and in lakes and wells. The image of the ungraspable, the phantom of life. And that is the key to it all. Wasn't that the coolest? At the very end of this episode, I'm going to put one more excerpt of Orson Welles reading Moby Dick. Both of these excerpts were recorded in 1971. Wells was filming what would become his movie, The Other Side of the Wind, and during a break from filming, he recorded excerpts of him reading Moby Dick. It was unclear what Wells intended to do with these recordings, but what was clear was that he had an unabiding love for Melville's masterpiece. In the 1950s, Orson Wells tried to mount an experimental play based on the novel. That play, sadly, has been lost. Those who are fans of both the movie Citizen Kane and the novel Moby Dick, as I am, know that later in the novel, the Pequod will encounter a vessel at sea with a name that had deep meaning to Orson Welles. We'll talk more about Citizen Kane and Moby Dick in next week's podcast. For now, I want to play a little more of Orson Welles performing from the novel. As you may already know, Welles played the role of Father Mapple in the 1956 big-budget Hollywood adaptation of Moby Dick. By the time Welles took on this role, he had already been a major and important advocate for Moby Dick as a major American work of art, and his advocacy was one of the reasons the novel finally found its audience. Here's Welles playing Father Mapple. And God had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Shipmates, the sin of Jonah was in his disobedience of the command of God. He found it a hard command. And it was, shipmates, for all the things that God would have us do are hard. If we would obey God, we must disobey ourselves. But Jonah still further flouts at God by seeking to flee from him. Jonah thinks that a ship made by men will carry him into countries where God does not reign. He prowls among the shipping like a vile burglar hastening to cross the seas. And as he comes aboard, the sailors mark him. The ship puts out. But soon the sea rebels. It will not bear the wicked burden. A dreadful storm comes up. The ship is like to break. The bosun calls all hands to lighten her. Boxes, bales, and jars are clattering overboard. The wind is shrieking, the men are yelling. I fear the Lord, cries Jonah, the God of heaven who hath made the sea and the dry land. I want to look at one particularly profound sentence in Moby Dick, one that, when you read it, makes you realize that Melville probably knew as he was writing the book that he was on the cutting edge and taking a big risk with this work. 
The sentence comes at the end of chapter 24, after Melville has just described the American whaling industry as it stood in the mid-19th century, when Melville himself became a whaler. Melville has Ishmael, his narrator, deliver the sentence, but the words are clearly direct from the author himself. To understand this sentence, we first need to understand that Melville, who is obviously a great mind of incredible literary talent, was unable to complete the kind of formal schooling that was typical of major novelists in the 19th century. Melville is an aberration this way. When he was a teen, his father died, and his family was left in dire financial straits. He bounced around a bit as a young man, encountering exactly the kind of wanderlust we see in Ishmael at the beginning of the novel. Then, in 1839, he took a post on a merchant ship. And after a year at sea transporting merchandise, in 1840, at age 21, he took the more daring and adventurous job of boarding a whaling ship, where he went on to have some utterly wild adventures we should talk about in future episodes. But he never went to college. And, as he explains in this phenomenal sentence, he didn't feel like he needed to. He felt like he got all the education a young man requires from the school of life aboard a whaling ship. Here's the sentence, the beautiful final sentence of chapter 24 of Moby Dick. And, as for me, if, by any possibility, there be any as yet undiscovered prime thing in me, if I shall ever deserve any real repute in that small but high hushed world, which I might not be unreasonably ambitious of, if hereafter I shall do anything that, upon the whole, a man might rather have done than to have left undone, if, at my death, my executors, or more properly, my creditors, find any precious manuscripts in my desk, then here I prospectively ascribe all the honor and the glory to whaling, for a whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. Before we finish here today, let's look at one more particularly stunning part from the first third of this novel. In chapter 47, the crew spots a whale. As he stood hovering over you, half suspended in air, so wildly and eagerly peering towards the horizon, you would have thought him some prophet or seer beholding the shadows of fate, and by those wild cries announcing their coming. There she blows! There! 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 She blows! She blows! There she blows! From where to starboard! There she blows! There go flukes! Flukes go down! Larboard! Larboard! Stall line, Tubbs! Do up the main settle! Right, Stub. A dollar you don't. The crew goes down in their rowboats to get close enough to throw their harpoons, and Melville gives us one of those marvelous descriptions that takes the reader right out onto the waves. The vast swells of the omnipotent sea, the surging, hollow roar they made as they rolled along the eight gunwales, like gigantic bulls in a boundless bowling green, the brief suspended agony of the boat as it would tip for an instant on the knife-like edge of the sharper waves, that almost seemed threatening to cut it in two, the sudden profound dip into the watery glens and hollows, the keen spurrings and goadings to gain the top of the opposite hill, the headlong sled-like slide down its other side, all these with the cries of the headsmen and harpooners, and the shuddering gasps of the oarsmen, with the wondrous sight of the ivory Pequod bearing down upon her boats with outstretched sails, like a wild hen after her screaming brood. All this was thrilling. They don't catch any whales on this particular hunt. In fact, amidst the chaos of multiple whales in the water, Ishmael's boat is nearly sunk. He makes it back to the Pequod, keenly aware that he has just come close to death. That's where we are when we open on chapter 49, and we get one of my favorite paragraphs from the entire novel. There are certain queer times and occasions in this strange mixed affair we call life when a man takes this whole universe for a vast practical joke. 
though the wit thereof he but dimly discerns and more than suspects that the joke is at nobody's expense but his own. However, nothing dispirits, and nothing seems worthwhile disputing. He bolts down all events, all creeds and beliefs and persuasions, all hard things visible and invisible, never mind how knobby, as an ostrich of potent digestion gobbles down bullets and gun flints. And as for small difficulties and worryings, prospects of sudden disaster, peril of life and limb, all these, and death itself, seem to him only sly, good-natured hits and jolly punches in the side bestowed by the unseen and unaccountable old joker. That odd sort of wayward mood I am speaking of comes over a man only in some time of extreme tribulation. It comes in the very midst of his earnestness, so that what just before might have seemed to him a thing most momentous, now seems but a part of the general joke. Friends, I love this. It's a brilliant thought, brilliantly expressed. Face a near-death experience and live to tell about it, and soon enough, all your troubles seem small. Melville is telling us that if we want the ability to just gobble down our troubles like an ostrich with potent digestion, then we need to have the courage to seek out bigger troubles. After you've nearly drowned in the open ocean amidst a flurry of angry whales, the daily troubles of a safe, sheltered life won't bother you nearly as much. Okay, here's our final, final thought on Moby Dick for today. For many 21st century Americans, including me, some of the most famous quotes from Moby Dick will forever ring out in our minds in the voice of the great Ricardo Montalban, who, in his most famous movie role as Captain Kirk's nemesis Khan in Star Trek, loved to recite from Melville's masterpiece. Khan's most famous recitations of this novel's potent poetry come later, but in the first third of the novel, we get a little bit of it, and I want to share it with you here. In chapter 30 of Moby Dick, Captain Ahab explains to the crew that this is more than a normal whaling voyage. This is a mission of revenge. Aye, Starbuck, aye, my hearties, all round. It was Moby Dick that dismasted me, Ahab says. Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. Aye, aye, and I'll chase him round Good Hope and round the Horn and round the Norway Maelstrom and round Perdition's Flames before I give him up. Here's Ricardo Montalban as Khan, reciting an adapted version of that line to describe his thirst for vengeance against Captain Kirk. He tasks me. He tasks me, and I shall have him. I'll chase him round the moons of Nibia and round the Antares maelstrom and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. Here's what's coming up on Deep Thinking About Great Books, the podcast. We're reading Moby Dick for the rest of January and into February. After we finish Moby Dick, we're reading To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And after that, we're going to read a few of Plato's dialogues and the history of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. If you aren't already, make sure you follow Deep Thinking About Great Books on Facebook, where we are, as of this recording, an online book club of nearly 12,000 members. On the Facebook page, I do daily mini-essays about the books we're reading, and marvelous discussion breaks out in the comments. Get in the search bar on your Facebook page and search for Deep Thinking About Great Books to get in on the discussion. Thanks for listening to the inaugural episode of Deep Thinking About Great Books. My name is Spencer Baum. I'm the author of seven novels and the administrator of Deep Thinking About Great Books, and I am producing this podcast as a labor of love and doing it without any commercial sponsors. If you want to support this podcast or my work on the Deep Thinking About Great Books Facebook page, I encourage you to check out my fiction, especially the audiobook version of my newest novel, The Tetronome Run, which I have released in its entirety as a free podcast. All my books are available for sale direct from me at spencerbaum.net. For the free Tetradome Run podcast, I have scored the entire audiobook with music and sound effects to sound like an action movie. Here's a two-minute excerpt for you. If you like what you hear, search for The Tetradome Run in your favorite podcast app. Turning on the TV was the mistake that killed him. He was 21 years old. His name was Kyle, and he hadn't planned on watching TV that afternoon or looking at his phone. 
or his laptop. But it's just so easy to turn on the screens, isn't it? So easy to let an afternoon's ambitions disappear in a wash of pixels. What am I doing? he muttered, tuning in like the rest of the world, watching the Tetradome run, waiting for the race to start, preparing to watch his sister run for her life. Months had passed since he said goodbye to Jenna in a stale, dusty room at the New Mexico State Pen. Months had passed since he sat in the execution theater, one of six official witnesses who was supposed to watch Jenna get strapped to a lethal injection table. Since the warden came into the theater and announced there would be no execution today, that Jenna had chosen to run in the Tetradome instead. Months of hiding from the media, moving from one short-term apartment rental to another, waiting all the while for his sister's death and dealing with that memoir she left behind for him. That memoir had been hanging over his head like the blade of a guillotine poised for release. The street outside his apartment was quiet. The people of the world were indoors, looking at their glowing screens. The official pre- Thanks again for listening, everyone. As promised earlier, here is one more Orson Welles excerpt reading Moby Dick. The after deck. A fair morning. Tied up, twisted, eyes like coal still glowing in the ashes of a ruin. Ahab lifts up to the clearness of the morn his splintered helmet of a brow. This glad, this happy air, this winsome sky at last seems almost to dissolve the canker-wrinkled beating in his heart. The cruel stepmother world now throws affectionate arms around that stubborn neck. Old Ahab drops a tear into the sea. How does the vast Pacific hold such wealth as that one drop?